Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So this Lent we're talking about giving up things. Last week we talked about giving up control, or more specifically the control that comes with the fear of missing out. And this week we're talking about giving up our expectations. Now, the question is, what is an expectation? Well, let's start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start, as Julie Andrews once said. Now, going to thethoris.com, it says that a synonym to expectation is assumption. Now, an assumption is, of course, the act of assuming. And we all know what happens when we assume. But I digress. We assume that something good is going to happen to us. We assume that something good is coming to us. And our society perpetuates that. Our society puts out this expectation that this is how life is supposed to look. And that if you do all the right things, if you make all the right connections, if you are the right kind of person, this is what your life will be. And there are three things that society tells us we are to expect. Now, one is that we are expect to have money. We do all the right things, make all the right people, make all the right choices. You will have money, and therefore you will have a certain kind of lifestyle. Number two, you are to expect that you will have a job, but not just a job, a job that has meaning, and a job that makes a difference in the world, and not just a difference to the local people, but a difference on the grand scale. People will know you because of your job. And the third is that you will have a partner in life and in love who completes you. You need nobody else but that one person. That one person who is your be-all, your end-all, your soulmate. This is what our society tells us we are to expect. And if you have any questions about this, about this, just go watch a television show, a movie, listen to some of our music. And one of the movies that I think of when I think about these three expectations is one that I have a very much love-hate relationship with. And that movie is Jerry Maguire. Who's seen it? Okay. Jerry Maguire. Yeah, see? I love this movie because it is endlessly quotable. There are very few people I know, even if they've not seen the movie, who don't at least know the phrases, show me the money, and help me to help you. Help me to help you. And you complete me. And last, but certainly not least, you had me at Hello. See? Very quotable. And I also love this movie because you have the man and the woman and the wonderful sidekick. And lastly, I love this movie because in a nice two-hour time span, you have the problem, the solution, and it's all tied up in that nice, neat bow. Wonderful things. Here's why I can't stand that movie. It perpetuates every single one of those expectations. Think about it. In this movie, Jerry Maguire, he's a sports agent, okay? And he has this moral awakening at the beginning of the movie, and he writes what he calls a mission statement. Everybody else calls it a memo. He calls it a mission statement about how they need to change the profession of being a sports agent. Well, at the beginning of the movie, being a sports agent, he has a lot of money. Okay? Now, part of the plot is that it goes 
down and things don't look so good for him. But at the end, the one client that stays with Jerry overcomes all the odds and he makes it big, which means that Jerry ends up making a lot of money. The second thing is that Jerry has a job that at first meh, doesn't seem so great, except for that it makes a lot of money. But by the end, Jerry's job has meaning, it makes a difference, and people know him because of what he does in his profession. He becomes very good friends with that one client who sticks with them, and they become kind of buddies. And at the very end of the movie, when the, the sports star has finally made it, everything good is happening to him, Jerry comes over and he hugs them, and they have their moment. And off to the side, there's another player and his agent. And that player looks down at his agent and says, why don't we have a relationship like that? And the other agent looks up at the player and goes, and he goes, ah. Again, it perpetuates this idea that your job is going to make a huge lasting impact on all the world. And then third, the relationship between Jerry and Dorothy. They come together and Jerry and Dorothy complete each other. They don't need anybody else but one another. <coughs> well, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but if you only have one person in your life that completes you, and you're either a statistical anomaly or you're lying to yourself. Because well-rounded individuals have many people in their lives, many outlets in their lives that help to complete who they are as people. You can see I have a love-hate uh, relationship with this movie because of the expectations it puts out there. We gotta throw those expectations out the window because they're not true. And Nicodemus today, in our reading from John, he comes into this situation with Jesus with his own set of expectations. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which they were more fair than you see. Okay, I had to throw it in there as a camp counselor. <laughs> Once a camp counselor, always a camp counselor. But anyways, a Pharisee was a religious lawyer. What this means is that at the time that Jesus lived, all the Jews lived by 613 laws found in the book of Leviticus. So if we open up our Bibles, it would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And therefore, as a religious lawyer, it was his job to know the laws so well that if anyone were to teach or to act accordingly, that it did not seem to jive with one of those laws, that the Pharisees would get together and have a discussion about whether or not they needed to offer some kind of direction to that individual. And my guess, based on how this whole scene opens up, is that is exactly what Nicodemus is coming to do. Because you see, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he comes in and he says, Well, Jesus, we know that you are a teacher, and that you come from God, because you are doing wonderful miracles, and only somebody who comes from God could do those miracles. And you can just hear the next word, right? But! And then you can hear the correction coming, right? Jesus stops him in his tracks, and he turns the tables on him. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, You know, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born anew. What? You must be born anew? Where did that come from, Jesus? That doesn't seem to fit in at all. But hey, this is where we are. Jesus is basically getting right to the heart of the matter, and he's saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I get it. You live in a world where God fits in a nice, neat little box. You live in a world where God acts according to all these rules, where everything God does hangs on the structure of this law. You expect that God is always going to follow those rules. 
throw it out. Get rid of that expectation. God doesn't work that way. God works in a way greater than you could ever imagine. God wants you to be born anew, something that you are having a hard time comprehending. But trust me, it will happen. Nicodemus is being challenged to give up all of his preconceived notions about who God is, what God can do, and how God is going to act. And today, and this Lent, we too need to give up our expectations about how God is going to work in the world and how God is going to act in the world. Because I can tell you, even myself, that what I expect God to do, God is not going to do. God is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. You know, oftentimes we like to, to think and we often hear, well, I've done all the right things. I've given enough money. I've given up my time. I've given up my talent. I am a good Christian person. So therefore, God should love me. It almost sounds like God is a heavenly banker. I give you this, you God give me this back. That's not how God works. God gives freely. And that can be really, really hard to swallow. But as you think about it, I'm a good person, you're a good person, we've done all these right things, but what about this guy over here, or that gal over there, or this person over there, who I don't think they've done anything good at all. In fact, I think they're pretty downright awful and rotten. Why do they get those good things? Why does God's grace extend to them? Because that's who God is. God loves all. Of God's people and what Christ did on the cross with his dying and his rising the grace that came from that the forgiveness of sins that came from that extends to all people we've got to throw out our expectation that God's love of grace and forgiveness are only for a select few and we have to get rid of this idea that if something bad happens in our life, God is punishing us for some reason. Sometimes bad things just happen. You know, we've heard the phrase, why do bad things happen to good people? Because sin is in the world. When Adam and Eve sinned at the beginning of all time, when sin came into the world, God's original plan for everything it got completely messed up and nothing works the way it was intended to work. And so when things don't work the way they're supposed to, that stuff just happens. God doesn't punish you because you did something small in this world. The thing is, God does accompany you. God does walk alongside you in the midst of all of that. You never walk this journey alone. When you are reborn through the waters of baptism, not only are you reborn as a child of God, you are reborn as a part of the body of Christ. And as a part of the body of Christ, you have many, many people who walk alongside with you. In the midst of those things that we cannot understand, know that you are never, ever alone. God promises us that he will love us to the end of time and beyond. God promises us that we never journey alone. And God promises to love us beyond all measure and beyond all human understanding. Those are things, my friends, that we can come to trust and to expect. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.